Alors, bienvenue tout le monde. C'est un grand plaisir d'introduire uh, Pierre Madeau. Uh, I will now switch to my usual language. Um, he, uh, so, Pierre um, is a very distinguished cosmologist. Um, he's um, been at Santa Cruz for a number of years. Um, um, and maybe is best known for um, the Madao diagram, the star formation history of the universe, but for many other issues in um, the high redshift universe with realization and galaxy formation and um, the uh, radiation fields in the universe. Um, he, we're, we're, it's a pleasure to have him today because he um, is finishing his term as a Blair Pascal chair, um, and which is partly why we had this magnificent uh, cafe just now. Um, and um, this is his closing uh, lecture. And in principle, um, these lectures are supposed to be a summary of what he's done during the, the course of the chair. Let, let me explain the Blaise Pascal chair. It's a very prestigious um, award from the um, Ile de France in the Ecole Normale Supérieure, which um, uh, gives the, the person selected um, to a two-year stint in Paris, of which he actually spent 12 months during those two years in Paris. And um, the only obligation is to give a course of lectures. And, um, and um, there's enough um, resources there for, for the person to support a research group, et cetera, during that period. And so it's a very prestigious thing, and it's um, wonderful to have had Piero here um, for that period to interact with many of us. So um, today, then, he's going to talk to us about the dark ages of the universe, how our cosmos survived. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Joe. Oops. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back here. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking, in fact, uh, a lot of people here uh, at the Institute, uh, Ecole Normale, uh, the City of Paris, for this fantastic opportunity. I enjoyed my stay here uh, quite a bit. I spent uh, about 12 months uh, here at the Institute over the last two years. Uh, unfortunately, I have to go back. I got a job somewhere else. Uh, and, uh, and so I have to go back to Santa Cruz, but it has been uh, a great time. Uh, I think this place, it's a fantastic place. Uh, you might not know uh, this, but uh, uh, the visitor program that you guys have, as well as the uh, amount of conferences and workshop here is second to none. Uh, I wish we had a similar program uh, where I'm from. Uh, and uh, and it, I really had a great time. Uh, and I hope I'll be able to come back. So I apologize for, um, uh, you know, this uh, uh, stuff being organized at the last moment. Uh, life has been complex over the last uh, few months, and so I could only swing by uh, at the end of this week and only for 48 hours. I also apologize for talking about realization. I heard that you heard a lot about this. Nick Nadin uh, was here a couple of weeks ago, and he talked, I'm sure he talked about his uh, simulations of reionization, Pascal Hirsch uh, gave a talk here on very high redshift universe. So you heard a lot of the stuff that I'm going to uh, mention today. Uh, well, uh, you know, you'll hear perhaps I'll have something more to say about the topic. So let me just remind you that the transformation of cold neutral intergalactic hydrogen uh, into a warm uh, ionized plasma marks the end of the cosmic dark ages and the beginning of the age of galaxies uh, after, uh, you know, hydrogen recombination or the redshift of 1,000 or so. Uh, it is the last major phase transition uh, which involves most of the virus in the universe. Uh, I think the one after that is the uh, uh, reionization of uh, uh, doubly ionized helium, which we believe is happening around redshift of three or so. So studies of cosmic realization have been highlighted uh, by the last decade of survey as one of the most promising areas of astrophysical research in this decade. Uh, and uh, you know, I've been working on this for about 20 years uh, or so. It has been a topic for theorists with very little observations. I think that is going to change 
uh, rapidly over the next few years. Thank God, uh, thank for James Webb uh, Space Telescope, JWST, which is going to be up in spring uh, 2019. Uh, perhaps W first, uh, if, uh, <laughs> if it's not canceled. Uh, the large uh, LSST, uh, for sure, giant 30 meter class optical telescope. Uh, there is the possibility to see neutral hydrogen at high redshift through 21 centimeter. That's, uh, you know, there are a number of experiments that are putting upper limits uh, at high redshift, but, uh, but with the square kilometer array, uh, that science uh, should, uh, uh, you know, really go into high gear. And of course, the next generation of radiation hydrodynamical simulation of supercomputers, like the one that Nick Nadine was showing uh, a couple of weeks ago. So, uh, and this is going to be basically the summary of my talk. There is a broad consensus on the epoch and duration of reionization process, uh, which is emerging from a variety of observational probes. And this is relatively new. Until a few years ago, there were large discrepancies uh, coming from uh, observations uh, of uh, CMB anisotropy versus what we learned by looking at high redshift sources. Uh, there seems to be some agreement now that reionization is occurring uh, late, uh, and so the timing of reionization uh, seems to be converging towards uh, something between, uh, you know, uh, redshift 10 to redshift 6. We still don't agree on the sources of UV radiation that cause uh, this phase transition. Uh, how those sources interact with the environment, the back reaction of, uh, of a homogeneous radiation field on the formation evolution of early dwarfs, and in particular the early thermodynamics of gas, of the intergalactic medium. Uh, these are uh, problems that uh, remain unsolved uh, despite a considerable uh, effort over the last uh, 20 years or so. So let me start by reminding you this is a quick uh, cosmic chronology. The universe recombines at a redshift of 1,000. It's opaque to Thomson scattering before recombination, uh, just too many electrons, uh, which makes the uh, photomine free path extremely short. It recombines neutral hydrogen, uh, only a few electrons left, uh, two parts by 10 to the 4. Uh, the universe becomes transparent uh, to Thomson scattering, but opaque to Lyman continuum absorption. Those are the dark ages of the universe where not much is happening except for uh, fluctuations in the dark matter that grow slowly in an expanding universe uh, and barons catching up, falling into the potential wells of the dark matter, cooling down uh, via uh, H2 cooling. Uh, H2 is the only molecule uh, that can cool down the gas to a few hundred Kelvin or so of very early time until the first stars uh, form and start to produce UV radiation that creates expanding H2 region in the universe, which we know overlap uh, by a redshift of six or so. Or at least that's the standard law, and I'm going to tell you that there are uh, a lot of uncertainties uh, on that. And the idea is that a redshift less than six, the universe becomes transparent. That's not really true. The intergalactic medium, the diffuse gas, becomes uh, optically thin. Uh, but there is still plenty of gas in the outskirts of galaxies, in the circumgalactic medium. That's the gas that we usually uh, term the Lyman limit systems. This is, uh, these are systems that have column densities above 10 to the 17 uh, centimeter minus 2 or so. They are optically thick to UV radiation. And in fact, they have a, a mean separation, which is really the mean free path uh, for Lyman continuum absorption. Uh, which is less than the horizon. Uh, let me go into that um, in more details now. So it is not true that after reionization, a redshift six or so, the universe is transparent. Uh, strictly speaking, it isn't. So how do we know what is the mean free path of uh, UV photons uh, at early times? This is mean, the mean free path at one Rydberg uh, as a function of redshift. You can measure that directly by stacking the spectra of quasars. Here there are about 150 quasars per redshift bin, and these are three different redshifts, uh, 4.5, 5.25. And you see that those spectra here, this is the Lyman limit system in the rest frame, the Lyman limit, sorry, uh, frequency, which is 912 in the rest frame. And you fit for this flux decrement, which is associated with the absorption on the line of sight. These are stacked spectra, though, again, 
about 150 quasars parachute bin. And uh, then you, do, you go through some math uh, and you work out what is the optical depth to Lyman continuum absorption that produces a mean free path uh, that is that particular curve there. So the mean free path, of course, is, incre is decreasing as we go to higher ratio. This is in megaparsec, uh, and it's a physical mean free path. And you see it goes from a couple of hundred megaparsec at redshift 2.5 or so down to 10 megaparsec at redshift 5. And that's the Hubble radius, which is simply C over H. Uh, H is the Hubble parameter, which gives you a size of the horizon. And because the mean free path is much smaller than that, that basically means that all UV radiation that gets produced in the universe at those redshift gets absorbed somewhere before you know, being redshifted by the Hubble expansion, which basically means that the universe is still optically thick uh, to UV radiation. And that's all true down to a redshift or two or so. It's only a redshift less than two. In fact, it's 1.6 or so uh, that the mean free path, uh, as measured from observation, starts to become as large as the horizon size, which basically means that photos, photons, UV photons, are streaming uh, through before without any absorption. So this has got implication, for example, because it's extremely difficult to reproduce the mean free path of the universe at uh, early time in numerical simulation. This is what happens when you do reionization at uh, petaflop speed, which is basically radiation hydrodynamics. Uh, big calculation, and this, in fact, is one of the latest uh, simulation, the Sphinx uh, radiation hydro simulation of the first billion years. This paper just came out. Uh, this is redshift 10, 8, and 6. And what's plotted here is the UV photonization rate uh, for hydrogen. And so you see the typical topology that you would expect from intergalactic uh, reionization. You see H2 region uh, produced uh, by galaxies, surrounding galaxies. The H2 regions uh, expand as you inject more UV radiation in the universe. And as the universe is, is uh, decreasing its density because of its expansion. And then in this particular simulation, they, those H2 regions overlap uh, by between redshift 8 and redshift 6. So this is the volume weighted neutral fraction in those simulations. Uh, here are, are the results of those simulations. There are two curves here, the blue one and the red one. The red one assumes that UV radiation is injected by a single star. Uh, and the blue curve is what happens if you consider binary stars. And the effect of binary stars is to increase the Lyman continuum yield of stellar population. You get, for a given star formation rate, more UV production. And so if you have a large population of binary stars at any time, you reionize the universe earlier than, uh, than otherwise. In fact, you might see, and these are observational data, I'll tell you exactly how those data uh, have been produced. And you see that typically simulations don't do a fantastic job in going through, in fact, any of those points. Uh, in particular, uh, this is uh, the neutral fraction of redshift six or so. And you see that uh, simulations tends to, in this particular case, tends to uh, ionize the universe too much compared to the data. So the IGM, the intergalactic medium, which is the main repository of baryons at early time, tends to be ionized sooner and to a greater extent when binary stars are included, which is the main outcome of this paper. So what's happening here? Uh, now, there are lots of uncertainties about redshift 9 or 10, etc. But the universe between 5 and 6 should be uh, better known. Uh, what's happening? Why there is a discrepancy, which is typical of hydrodynamic simulations uh, at, uh, at those epochs. Uh, the uh, universe is more neutral uh, than expected. My take on this, and again, these are new simulations, so you know, take all of this with a grain of salt. My take of this is that these simulations have relatively small boxes, and they don't, they don't uh, produce uh, the optically thick absorption that I was mentioning. The Lyman limit systems that are around galaxies, the circumgalactic medium of galaxies is not well reproduced by this type of simulation, perhaps because of resolution issues, uh, or perhaps uh, uh, because there is something, some physics missing uh, which caused the mean free path of uh, radiation at this epoch to be smaller, in fact, uh, than is, uh, is inferred by those simulations. 
It might be, in fact, that uh, the universe doesn't have these very many binaries, and so the real case is between uh, those two uh, curves, and so perhaps there is a way uh, to reproduce the data. Uh, one more thing to notice is that in this particular realization, there is a sharp transition between a universe that is mostly neutral at early time and a universe that is highly ionized by a redshift less than six or so. Okay, this is all happening over a delta Z uh, in redshift uh, space that is just a few, three, maybe, four. Okay, uh, what else, what other information do we know about the uh, realization state of the universe? Well, uh, this is what we get from uh, CMB anisotropies. This is the Thomson scattering optical depth to realization as a function of observer time, which is in fact as a function of the time at which those experiments uh, produce data. So this is the Thomson scattering optical depth. Uh, this is W map points in the blue, Planck in red. Uh, and uh, uh, this is not a consequence of the expansion of the universe, it's just that uh, different satellites disagreed. Uh, w map at early time in 2000, beginning of 2000, uh, 2002 or 2003 told us the optical depth was as large as 17%, which basically meant that a lot of people had to invoke an extra population of early sources. It was very difficult to reorganize the universe to produce such a large optical depth. And so people went crazy, population three, I mean, including myself, uh, meaning quasars, double ionization, et cetera, et cetera. All that stuff is gone, okay? Uh, the Thomson scattering optical depth, as inferred from CMB anisotropies and polarization, has been steadily decreasing. It's sort of converging to a value that is about 5%. Okay, I hope it has converged, uh, because you don't expect it to be much less than 5%, simply because we know the universe is ionized at redshift less than 6 or so, and if you compute the total integrated op optical depth from 0 to 6, you get a number that is something like 4% or so, but, uh, but. So Planck, I think, got it right. 5% uh, of the optical depth, that basically means that the universe gets reionized relatively late, uh, and, uh, and there are not very many free, elect free electrons at redshift greater than 10 or so. So uh, just to tell you a little bit more about uh, the latest Planck, a constraint on realization history. Uh, so this is what you get by combining CMB polarization and kinetic sinusoidal Zaldovich effect uh, data from the ground. This is uh, 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 SPT and ACT. Uh, the redshift at which half of the universe is reionized uh, seem to be uh, about uh, seven or eight or so, plus or minus one. And the duration of reionization uh, it's, uh, as I was saying, between three and perhaps five. Uh, and this is from the paper from the uh, 2016 uh, Planck paper. In all cases, we find that the universe is ionized at less than 10% level, a redshift about z equal 10. Okay, that basically means there is not a lot of star formation activity. Uh, there are not very many AGN producing UV radiation, a redshift greater than 10, because if that were true, the optical depth uh, from this type of experiment would have been large uh, than, uh, than what it is observed, okay? So star formation start to be common in the universe, a redshift, if it's star formation that is producing enough UV radiation to reionize uh, the baryons in the universe, uh, star formation, in fact, is probably relatively small at higher redshift. So that's where reionization starts, and then the, uh, another question is, when does it end? Okay, is it six, around six? I told you around six, but uh, what can we tell? So these are uh, spectra of high redshift quasars. These are a redshift of 7.1, uh, 6 to 6.3, 5.98. Uh, three different quasars which show this, this is the UV, rest frame UV, um, and basically this is the Gam peterson Traft, which shows that there is no flux along those regions and there is no transmitted flux because gas is uh, it's relatively neutral. Okay? So at a high redshift, there is very little leakage, a uh, shortword of uh, Lyman alpha in emission. 
uh, these photons are produced at a frequency that is larger than lemon alpha. They get redshifted by the Hubble expansion. At a certain point, they become resonant. They find some neutral hydrogen. At that particular redshift, they're scattered off the line of sight, and you see zero flux. That's what you're looking at. Uh, the fact that uh, at this redshift here, which is redshift less than six or so, most of the gas seems to be ionized along that particular line of sight. Uh, how big are this region with zero transmission? These are large regions of the sky. This is 240 co-moving megaparsec H inverse at that particular redshift. Okay? Uh, so big chunk of, of the early universe uh, that uh, seems to have zero transmission in Lyman alpha. Uh, that's a region at redshift of 5.5 to 5.9, which is again 110 H inverse uh, megaparsec, and there is zero flux being transmitted. And then you start to see leakage here at lower redshift, as those regions, in fact, are more highly ionized. Okay, so basically, this type of data tells you that at redshift 5.8 or so, there were still a large chunk of the universe. Uh, which were, uh, you know, more neutral uh, than the rest. And so perhaps this is the trailing end of reionization. Uh, you don't find any of this uh, large absorption trough a redshift less than 5.5. Okay, the entire UV flux gets transmitted. So, uh, you know, uh, not very many of these squares are at that particular epoch, uh, but uh, 5.8 or so seems to be a good number to remember when, in fact, the diffuse gas gets highly ionized. Now, there is an uncertainty in all uh, this type of reasoning. Uh, we know that gas is more neutral here. There are two reasons why it might be more neutral. One is because the photonization rate is not particularly high, because UV photons have not reached that particular region, uh, and that's what you expect from reionization, or because the recombination rate of the gas is low. Relative recombination depends on the temperature, and so, in principle, uh, one of that region, there could be large regions in the universe where the temperature uh, is lower, uh, and so those regions are recombining faster and gas is more neutral there. We don't know, we cannot distinguish between those two alternatives. So there are a number of probes of uh, reionization at early time. Uh, we discussed some of them. This is uh, optical depth, Thomson scattering optical depth as a function of redshift. This is what we get uh, from CMB anisotropies. We look at the star formation history. I'm sure Pascal uh, showed uh, that plot uh, when he gave his colloquium here. Uh, this comes from his paper. This is cosmic star formation rate density as a function of redshift. Uh, kinetics, you know, is effect. This is the highest redshift quasar known. It's at a redshift of 7.54, uh, discovered in December. Uh, this is Lyman alpha and emission. It shows what is called the damping wing of the Gunn Peterson uh, trough, uh, and, uh, and because of that profile, uh, you can infer what is the density of neutral gas in front of that quasar, which comes to about 50% or so. Uh, there are other probes of reionization. Uh, one in particular is Lyman alpha emitters. Uh, at early time, we know that uh, the abundance of Lyman alpha emitting galaxies uh, decreases above redshift seven or so. Uh, we don't know whether that's a, an intrinsic effect. There are not very many Lyman alpha emitters at those epochs. Uh, the idea that people are exploring, in fact, is that the Lyman alpha emitters are there by Lyman alpha uh, transmission because there is plenty of neutral gas in front of them. Uh, this is pre reionization. Uh, that intergalactic medium is going to absorb and scatter off the line of sight. Uh, Lyman alpha, and that's why Lyman alpha emitters are disappearing at early time. They are there, they are just uh, not detectable uh, in narrowband surveys simply because of, of neutral gas in front of them. Uh, there are other probes. Uh, this is the uh, thermal evolution. This is temperature of the IGM as a function of redshift. Uh, this is uh, uh, Lyman alpha optical depth. Uh, as a function of redshift, which is also a measurement of how neutral uh, the gas is around redshift six or so. We also look at fluctuations in the ionizing background, and this is an interesting uh, technique, and uh, I'm going to go back to that. Uh, basically, fluctuations tells you whether the sources that are keeping the universe ionized at those 
redshift are something like faint galaxies. They are very common. And then in that case, you would expect fluctuations to be very small. Or there is a contribution from quasars. Quasars are rare, extremely bright. And then you expect if quasars uh, are uh, the dominant source of UV radiation at those early times, you would expect fluctuations to be very large. Okay? So you can look at those fluctuations and try to infer what are the sources that are keeping the universe ionized at those redshift. So let me try to put together for you in a sort of concordance reionization history, which is just a toy model. Okay, so this is log neutral fraction. This is the volume average neutral fraction of hydrogen as a function of redshift from redshift 10 or so uh, down to redshift 5. Uh, those are the observations, all those points. This is a toy model, uh, which I, in fact I worked out while I was here uh, last year or so, uh, which uh, inject about three photons, three UV photons per hydrogen atoms per giga year. Okay? That's the photon budget. Okay? You can treat reionization uh, as basically a photon budget issue. Uh, do we produce enough UV radiation? What is the fraction of those photons that have to be reused because the universe is recombining uh, and then try to get back to the sources? Okay, so if we had a population of galaxies or a gen that was injecting in the intergalactic medium three UV photons per hydrogen atom uh, per giga year, we could explain a bunch of observations from CMB, a type of observation to Lyman alpha meters, damping wings and Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, Gamm Peterson Trough, are low ratios. Okay? So, uh, according to this type of, uh, of modeling, cosmic ionization was completed, which means the universe became ionized at more than 99% uh, around redshift 6, and above redshift 10, hydrogen was less than 10% ionized. Of course, the issue is fine, this is what I'm injecting into the intergalactic medium. Uh, what are the sources of this UV photon production rate? Now, I said a toy model, uh, but it's not, you know, there is some math behind it. I don't want to go through the detail. You have to do relative transfer. Uh, you uh, make some assumption, uh, like some source function approximation, which turns uh, the UV background into... Uh, an emissivity, you write UV background as the product of the emissivity times the mean free path, and you go through this and you derive what is called a reionization equation, which tells you that the rate of change of the uh, volume average uh, ionized fraction is given by the emissivity of UV radiation per unit hydrogen atoms. Uh, that's the source term, which is weighted by the opacity or the mean free path associated with the intergalactic medium and Lyman limit system, minus the sync term, which is just associated with recombination. Okay? Photon production minus recombination gives you how fast those H2 regions are uh, growing as the universe is expanding and when they do overlap. Uh, what is the importance of recombination? Well, Okay, so what I plotted here in that type of model is, as a function of redshift, the source term, which is the photonization rate, and the recombination rate, which is given by that term. So that's the relative recombination rate as a function of cosmic time, and that's the photonization rate. This is just to show you that at early time, the photonization rate dominates over recombination. Recombination plays basically no role, which is exactly why those H2 regions keep expanding. Right, that's exactly what you want if you want those H2 regions to overlap and ionize the entire universe. And it comes to a point around redshift 6 where the photonization uh, rate drop uh, because the neutral fraction is decreasing and H H2 regions have overlapped. And radiative recombination rate keeps increasing because more and more of the universe is photoionized. At a certain point, they go into equilibrium at redshift 6, and beyond that, you're in photonization equilibrium where the two balance each other. And the universe has been reionized. Okay, this is all great, uh, except that it's a toy model. We haven't used any real source to produce that. We just said we are injecting three photons per hydrogen atom per giga year. Uh, 
And then the question is, what are the sources of UV photons? Is there anything missing here? Do we have enough sources? So this is uh, the uh, uh, star formation rate uh, as a function of redshift from galaxies. And now the issue there is, this is the luminosity function of star forming galaxy at early time. How far do I go uh, uh, to what sort of faint magnitude and with what slope uh, do I extrapolate to get a photon production rate? And uh, people have, uh, uh, they tend to disagree on the slope of the uh, luminosity function uh, at very faint magnitude. And so what I've done here is giving you some idea of what happens if I integrate the luminosity function as produced uh, by observer like uh, Akim here uh, down to minus 16 uh, magnitude, uh, which is relatively bright there. Uh, or down to minus 13, which is much fainter than that. You can try to get a luminosity function down to those faint magnitude by using gravitational lensing. Those are the Hubble frontier fields. But of course, the interpretation of gravitational lensing data, it's non-trivial. So we don't know how many extremely faint sources there are in the universe, uh, those redshift. Uh, and so there is some uncertainty there on what is the total UV photon production rate uh, from galaxies. Now, let me assume there is another uncertainty there, which is given a certain UV photon production rate in galaxies, how many photons are escaping the star-forming region into the intergalactic gas, right? Because those are the photons that I'm using uh, to reionize the universe. The photons that stay within galaxies are reionizing only the interstellar medium. So I need to know what is the fraction of UV radiation that escaped from a galaxy into uh, the intergalactic medium. So I run a bunch of models there. Uh, these are, let me uh, just tell you, so these are models where I integrate the luminosity function down to relatively bright magnitude. And if I want to explain the data, uh, these different curves are those, that particular toy model for escape fraction of 20%, 25%, or 30% or so. So if I want to reproduce the data, I did an escape fraction volume or luminosity average of about 25% or so. And if I'm willing to say there are many more faint sources with a steep luminosity function down to minus 13, then I'm okay with an escape fraction of 15%. So basically there are enough UV photons produced by galaxies to ionize the universe as a whole according uh, to the observation, provide that at least 15% of the photons that are produced escape from galaxies into the intergalactic medium. 15%, perhaps as much as 25%. Is that a small number? Is that a large number? Uh, what is the fraction of UV radiation that escapes the Milky Way disk? How much would you say? How do we know? OK, we know we can look at H alpha in the Magellanic stream. And so if there was a lot of UV radiation from the disk escaping there, you would see H alpha fluorescence. OK? None has been detected. So what's the constraint on the escape fraction of UV radiation from the Milky Way? Less than 3%. There, are, there is a lot, a lot of UV photons produced by star formation in the Milky Way disk that escape far into the halo. They're all absorbed there. OK, so 15% is not a small number. Uh, but of course, the hope is at early time, you don't have Milky Way type of system. You have dwarfs and perhaps uh, the dwarfs are, uh, have you know, different densities of gas. They don't have well-established uh, thick disks. And perhaps the UV radiation is escaping from the dwarfs much more easily than it escapes from, uh, from uh, Milky Way type of systems today. Or you can say, well, perhaps uh, the escape fraction is larger at early time, even in massive galaxies. And people have tried to do that, to do that experiment. There has been a huge effort over the last 10 years to detect Lyman continuum radiation from Lyman break galaxy at a high redshift. Okay, hundreds of systems have been looked at using HST data, and there are very few systems where we see any leakage. Okay, so the typical constraint uh, from high redshift galaxies are redshift three or so. These are bright Lyman break uh, type of galaxies. The escape fraction seems to be less than 2%. There were some claims in the past uh, that we saw uh, Lyman continuum leakage 
from Lyman Bray galaxies. What happened, in fact, it was not a Lyman Bray galaxy. It was foreground contamination uh, from nearby systems, which you only resolve at HST type of resolution, and you don't see those from, those from the ground. Okay? So a huge amount of telescope time has gone into detect, uh, trying to detect UV radiation escaping from those galaxies. This is one example where, in fact, the escape fraction is large. More than 50% of the photons produced by this system are escaping. Uh, there are not very many of these. In fact, I think there are just a few. This is a O3 emitter. Uh, it's a system that has got a lot of O3. Uh, Lyman continuum emission, which you see here, uh, that's the uh, Lyman continuum lambda less than 912 uh, or so. Uh, that's UV radiation that is leaking through the IGM. That's why we are seeing it. It's a very compact source. In fact, it's especially unresolved in the center of that galaxy has got an effective radius of 200 parsec. And it's a strong O3 emitter, uh, which makes you wonder whether, in fact, there is an AGN inside that particular system. Okay, this is pretty much what we know. That uh, O3, strong O3 system seems to have relatively large escape fraction, uh, but there are not very many of them. And so once you average over the entire luminosity function of galaxies, at least at this epoch, ratio of three or so, uh, the escape fraction is, is not very large, uh, say less than 2%. We need 15, 25% at redshift is equal or greater than six. So perhaps things are changing as a function of cosmic time, that's the hope. Uh, why don't we know more about the escape fraction at redshift greater than four? At redshift greater than four, the intergalactic medium becomes opaque. And so even if those photons uh, from star-forming galaxy were leaking into the IGM, we wouldn't be able to see it, to detect it at Earth. So it is a, a type of experiment uh, that uh, we cannot perform a ratio greater than four. There is another issue with, uh, with star-forming galaxies as, or at least faint galaxies, as being uh, the main source of UV radiation. Uh, at, uh, at redshift six or so. And that issue has got, uh, it's connected with the fact that there are spatial fluctuations uh, in uh, the transmission of Lyman alpha, uh, which are observed. And those fluctuations are much larger than you would predict in a universe that is ionized by a lot of faint galaxies. Simply because the UV background associated with those very many faint sources uh, would be almost smooth. Tiny fluctuations. Uh, and, uh, and then why would uh, the optical depth to Lyman alpha changes, uh, change from line of sight to line of sight, uh, that much, that's much more than you predict just by density fluctuations. So there are large fluctuations in the UV flux at this redshift, re redshift close than six or so, uh, but those are not the fluctuations you would expect from a numerous or abundant population of faint sources. So in this particular uh, uh, simulation by Chardin uh, and Martin Annelt, those guys said, if I want to reproduce the data, I need bright sources which are producing large fluctuations uh, in the UV background at those epoch. Uh, how many quasars? You need about 50% of UV background at those epoch to be produced by quasar, uh, bright quasar, which are rare. Uh, and cause large fluctuations in UV, which trigger large fluctuations in the optical depth at Lamanov. The problem is we don't see very many quasars at that epoch. Well, most people don't see it. Uh, this is a paper from uh, uh, John Longo et al. a few years ago. Uh, by looking at the uh, Chandra deep field south, John Longo et al. found uh, 20 faint AGN uh, at extremely high redshift and their luminosity function at different redshift plotted here, uh, 4.25, 4.75, 5.75. Uh, there were so many faint AGN at those early epoch uh, that once you integrate, and of course there are large uncertainties in the total luminosity function of AGN, uh, but if you are generous uh, with the data, you can produce a lot of UV radiation at early time, and that will basically mean, well, uh, perhaps there are many more quasars that we thought at those epochs, which are causing those large fluctuations, and they're responsible for reionizing the universe. Okay? So what's the advantage of quasars 
compared to galaxies, UV radiation leak leakage from quasars is extremely high. Okay, the escape fraction from quasar is, is about unity, 100%. Uh, this is a, uh, a stack of about 2,000 quasars uh, from the both survey, a redshift between 3.6 and 4, and the average escape fraction from the quasar population is 80%. So somehow, it's very difficult for UV radiation to escape the star-forming disks, and that's why I told you a typical escape fraction of only uh, a few percent from galaxies, but if there is an AGN shining at the center that is clearing the circumgalactic medium of that system, then the escape fraction becomes unity. All the radiation that is produced at the center is able to escape from the system. Okay, that's perhaps it's associated uh, with the fact that, uh, that AGN are powerful sources, they have duty cycle, they're extremely bright, uh, they produce wind, I don't know if it's that associated with the UV radiation from the quasar, or just the wind that is uh, removing all the gas along the line of sight. But this is a, an observational fact. Escape fraction of order unity, this is true at all redshift. Uh, when you have quasars, the escape fraction of 912 is of order unity, when you have galaxies, a few percent. So the big problem with uh, realization this stage is that we know there are a lot of early galaxies, galaxies at uh, high redshift, which are producing UV radiation. We just don't seem to be able to detect any leakage uh, from the uh, star-forming disk into the intergalactic medium. There is a population that has got a leakage of 100%, and those are AGN, but there are not very many of them. So when I gave that talk at Stanford, Somebody said, have you thought about cosmic rays? And I said, why would I think about cosmic rays? And they said, because you guys seem to be desperate. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we are as desperate as to invoke cosmic rays or, or gamma rays or any exotic source, uh, but uh, this is the nature of the game. Okay, uh, there was another point that I wanted to raise. There is more information on reionization coming from the thermodynamics of the intergalactic medium. Okay, so this is the Lyman Alpha Forest, and you try to reproduce the Lyman Alpha Forest in numerical simulation. And one of the advantages of numerical simulation is that you can arbitrarily change the temperature of intergalactic gas until you fit the data. So what happens when you change the temperature of intergalactic gas? These are simulations. Again, that's a mock spectrum. Uh, and uh, this is a redshift of 2.5, 4.5. And you see two simulations where the temperature of gas at the mean density, it's 10,000 Kelvin in blue versus 20,000 Kelvin in, in red. And so what happens uh, when the uh, gas is uh, hotter is that uh, you wash out uh, you know, small scale fluctuations because of gene smoothing. And then you compare that with the data and you get a temperature out. So what is the characteristic temperature of the IGM that uh, fits the data? Uh, and uh, you get something like this, okay? So that's the uh, temperature from Becker et al. That's the temperature of, uh, of, that's the gas temperature of gas of intergalactic medium at the mean, temper at the mean density, sorry. Uh, this is 10,000 Kelvin. Uh, the prediction, if you photoionize gas at early time due to uh, hydrogen reionization, is that you raise the temperature, and then because of adiabatic expansion, that temperature will drop. And so what I've done here is that heat up the gas. Uh, this is the uh, uh, temperature equation, the temperature evolution for gas at the mean density. Uh, so you assume all the gas at the mean density. Uh, this is uh, cooling due to expansion. That's the Hubble parameter at early time. Uh, there is a variation in the temperature associated with the fact you're changing uh, the number of, of species there, and that's heating minus cooling, and the heating is associated with photoionization. So what I've done here is photoionize the gas, flash photoionization, RSG 15, 12, 9, and 7, and you see that the temperature of the gas, it's increased at the beginning, and then it starts to cool down, and it reaches a thermal asymptote, a redshift less than 5, uh, which should be uh, well less than 10,000 Kelvin independent of when you photoionize the gas, which, of course, uh, we don't know. This is uh, hydrogen photoionization only. 
and you compare those predictions with the data, uh, and this is a bad fit even in astronomy. Okay? So, uh, thank God there is an, a, an explanation for that. The explanation is, well, there is another source of heating in the universe, which is the reionization of helium. Once you reionize helium, doubly ionize helium, photons uh, which have uh, energies above 54.4 electron volt start leaking through, they have high energies, they photoionize the gas in the optical thin approximation, and they raise the temperature. So uh, the implication of this versus that is that there is a lot of helium reionization happening at redshift 3 or so. Now, if the sources of hydrogen reionization, which is happening at earlier time, perhaps 7, are AGN, are quasars, because quasars are producing a lot of hard UV radiation as well as X-rays, you would expect helium reionization to occur very early, like this, and then it would start cooling down again and you would not be able to reproduce the data, which is exactly what happens here. This is a paper by D'Aloisio et al. of last year. I've done recent calculation while, while I was here uh, with a group in Cambridge uh, where we assumed that there were plenty of AGN at early time. We ionized hydrogen, assuming the escape fraction from AGN was, was uh, from quasar was of order unity. Uh, etc. And these are the typical temperature evolution that you get, that type of curve. Uh, at Rashid 5 or so, the temperature should already be, uh, you know, 30,000 or above, uh, compared to what is observed, which is less than 10,000. So if there are lots of faint AGN, which are the sources of hard UV radiation, those faint AGN are reionizing helium very early. You raise the adiabat of the entire universe, to values that don't fit the data. Okay? So that's a, a strong constraint on the existence of very early uh, active galactic nuclei uh, at high redshifts. So uh, that was basically it. Uh, I don't have a full uh, theoretical explanation uh, to what's happening. This is reionization era phenomenology. Uh, there are issues. Uh, this is a sign frontier that is just beginning to be probed by existing telescope. Uh, and so the sort of data that I was mentioning uh, are coming typically from HST or ground-based data. There's going to be a flood of data on the high redshift universe when JWST uh, fly in a couple of years or so. In principle, uh, JWST will lead to the discovery of star-forming galaxies at to redshift 15 the tracing of the evolution of the cosmic star formation rate density to very high redshift, the measurement of the evolving fraction of laminar alpha emitters. Uh, we'll have detailed studies of the near zone around quasars. And so the hope is that, uh, you know, this flood of, uh, of data from GWST is going to provide some tight constraint on the reionization history and the contribution of different sources to ionizing photon budget of the universe. It's still unclear. Uh, today, uh, what are the main sources of UV photons at early time? Uh, we see plenty of star formation. Uh, we just don't uh, understand how those UV photons are escaping the side of star formation into the intergalactic medium. Uh, we know that uh, it happens in the case of quasars, but there are not very many quasars at early time. The quasar epoch seems to be at a lower redshift compared to the characteristic star formation epoch. Uh, we don't even understand why that is the case, whether there are not black holes or supermassive black holes are actually greater than five or so, or whether they are there but are obscured, of course, for the uh, realization uh, history. If they're obscure, well, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. It's just like they're not there in the first place. Uh, it's, uh, uh, there is an intriguing possibility that there are lots of faint AGN that have not been detected yet, However, if they were there at early time, they would reionize helium early and drive the temperature of the IGM to values that are not like the one that are observed. So we still don't know. Uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's a slow process, and this is a relatively easy uh, galaxy formation issue, right? This feedback, yeah, they do play a role on small scales, uh, but you would expect that the physics of, of, of photonization 
uh, and uh, you know, relative transfer in a diffuse universe would be relatively easy to understand. We have been fighting this problem uh, for 20 years, and I don't think there is any solution yet. Thank you very much. For you, what's the um, overwhelming theoretical uncertainty that for you that we haven't resolved the problem yet? Huh? Because you said it's quite easy. <laughs> no, no, it's quite easy uh, to model that, uh, provide you know there are sources. So, the, so I think, uh, as I was saying, uh, we don't know in the case of, of star forming galaxy what is the escape fraction. Uh, I don't think that's a, that's a theoretical uncertainty. It would be nice to have observations that tell you what that is. Uh, I'm not sure we'll, uh, we'll shed more light uh, on that in the future. Um, it's a bunch of stuff. It's a bunch of stuff. I was trying to, uh, to, to find what's, for, for example, okay, so I said that in the case of Quasar, that Quasar reionized helium very early and that we raised the temperature, so that cannot be true because the temperature is too high compared to the observation. That assumes that the escape fraction of four Rydberg is equal to the escape fraction of one Rydberg, which is unity. We have no idea what the escape fraction uh, at uh, four quasar is at 54.4 electron volt. So in principle, and I don't, I'm not aware of any type of observation, in fact, uh, that is uh, telling you what is the fraction of, of hard photons that are escaping from AGN. Uh, so that's another theoretical uncertainty. Uh, which, uh, you know, I'd like uh, that to be clarified relatively soon. So, so most uh, theoretical uncertainties are in the nature of the sources and how many sources there are as a function of epoch, I would say, but I might change my mind. Okay, yes. thank you very much, Fiero, for, for this very nice presentation, but you focused on redshift uh, six, yes. essentially, and you tried it was very interesting to extend to or achieve 12. And yes. my question is, we are discovering luminosity function of galaxies at achieve eight or more. Yes. So what will be the change in your estimates of uh, escape fraction and so on, if we have a very high population of massive galaxy at achieve 12? Okay, so I was assumed, so I was using uh, you know, whatever people say is the luminosity function of redshift 10. Uh, much beyond that, uh, there are uncertainties, as you said. There might be a large population. Now, Planck is telling us that there isn't a lot of uh, ionized gas at redshift greater than 10, uh, because otherwise the optical depth to Thomson scattering would be much larger than 5%. Uh, so I'm not sure that that's a large uncertainty, given what Planck uh, is, is saying. Having said that, uh, you know, uh, CMB experiment have changed uh, their number uh, over time. So, so let, let, let's wait a little bit for that uh, to settle down. But yes, you are right. In principle, there could be a large population of galaxies at early time, at very early time, uh, that is producing more UV radiation, which we, uh, which we have accounted for. That's always the case. Uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, I'm not sure that's the largest uncertainty. Uh, I think the larger uncertainty is the, the galaxies that we know of don't seem to have uh, any leakage uh, at redshift 3, and then we extrapolate, which is what we can do. Okay, anybody else? Hey, Pierre. Uh, just a naive question. Do you have an idea of the duty cycle of AGNs at these redshifts and how this would affect the... I mean, because we can have low fractions but very fast duty cycles that uh, would anyway be enough to, to ionize? Well, in know. some sense, what you see is what you get in this game. Once you have a luminosity function, you know, you are observing all the quasars that are shining at that particular epoch. So, you know, the, the, uh, the duty cycle may enter in how you average the escape fraction, et cetera, et cetera. But not in terms of, of the emissivity. Because we are seeing, well, if the observers are right, say a Rashid 4, we are seeing the quasar that are shining in that moment. 
and, and whether some of them will uh, shut down at a later time because of some quick duty cycle, that's fine. Uh, but, uh, but that only means there are many more quasars, in fact, we're only seeing a fraction of the quasar population. Uh, but that fraction is active at that time, and that's what's producing the UV radiation. So if we have a good luminosity function, we should be able to compute the emissivity uh, without that particular type of uncertainty. Um, the same is true for beaming. I mean, some people have said, what if the UV uh, radiation that is escaping is not isotropic? Uh, again, uh, what you see is what you get. You're assuming it's, it's, it's emitted over 4 pi, but if it's beamed, that means there, is a, there are many more quasars that you don't detect, and the two effect cancels out. So I don't think that's a large uncertainty. Okay, let me just ask one last question. Um, you've shown us that photonization is leading to big, ish, big problems, maybe, um, which we haven't resolved yet. Yes. Do you think there's any role for collisionization of the no. AGM? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, because, uh, because photonization is extremely efficient. Uh, at ionizing gas. We know gas, it's highly ionized. If you want to, and so with photoionization, you can, you can ionize the gas and keep it at a temperature of 10 to the 4 Kelvin. If you want to highly ionize gas with collision ionization, you need 10 to the 5 Kelvin. Uh, and those early times, you start to run into problem with the Compton Y parameter. So, so that's an interesting exercise, in fact. You can say, well, let's assume all the gas is not at 10 to the 4, but it's a few by 10 to the 5, so it's collision ionized. Uh, as you go to Rashid 5 or 6, 8, 7, then your Compton Y parameter uh, starts to become larger than observations of, of the cosmic microwave background allow you. Uh, and, uh, and of course, you know, there are future missions for CMB type of observation uh, which might give you the Y parameter uh, to much higher precision than we have now. Now I think it's what, 10 to the minus 5 or a few by 10 to the minus 4. That's the constraint from Kobe. Good. Okay, so I think it's time to thank Piero for a thank you. review. Thanks to you.